episode number 18. Uh, very excited to finally get this one done. Me and uh, Chad have been trying to work this one out for a while now. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, um, this is Chad T. Uh, Chad and I go back. Uh, we played football together at Mount Union, um, which is when we kind of started. We both took the same exercise science classes, and that's really when we started collaborating. Um, was there, D, I, I tell you all the time, one of the best about D3 is you have to figure some of your own training modalities out, and you don't have a strength coach, you don't have a nutritionist, you don't have a physical therapist, you don't have a, a chiropractor, you just kind of have to figure these out. So um, Chad and I kind of started racking our brains together, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago. So um, we got out and obviously we kind of took different paths. Chad, uh, I'll let you kind of tell you specifically about what he does, because I don't want to say he's a chiropractor, because he's much more than that. Um, uh, and I obviously with the training has been around, but ever, you know, since we've been in this, we have continued to collaborate and work together. And, I bring all my NFL athletes to chat to come back and train, and uh, we'll kind of get into that a little more as well later. But um, anybody watching, and obviously you guys who, who has joint dysfunction, movement dysfunction, um, or lives with pain, you know, this is a guy that I send everybody to, and, and he's uh, got a pretty good rate of return. So uh, I'll let Chad kind of tell you guys about himself. Um, and then we're going to kind of go through, you know, Chad's philosophy of, you know, joint by joint approach and how to, how to see dysfunction, how to correct dysfunction in movement patterns and joint pattern. Um, and we'll go from there. So Chad, you want to just kind of tell my staff about yourself? Yeah, I, um, I went to Mount Union with Matt. Uh, I was exercise physiology or exercise science, and I also had a chemistry minor. Uh, that's what really helped me get into the school I went to in Florida, Palmer. Uh, Palmer College of Chiropractic. Uh, I am a chiropractor, and that really was the starting platform to what I do now. Um, I don't only just adjust, I work a lot with athletes, and when I say athlete, I mean someone that is elite, like the NFL guys that Matt has sent me, uh, all the way to someone that is 90 years old that wants to just move well um, and get up off the couch and just you know not have back pain or hip pain or knee pain or shoulder pain. Um, and really just finding simple little things uh, in people's everyday movement that causes them their dysfunctions. Uh, it's not hard to find. Uh, it's really easy and simple. I mean, once you get used to it and learn how to do it. But from a coaching standpoint, standpoint from all of you guys, uh, it's huge to just be able to see these little things daily that you can see in a group setting, and it doesn't have to be individualized stuff. You know, you can have you know, 30 to 40 people doing these exercises, and if you see that, boom, pull them, boom, pull them, and just tell them those little cues that, you know, they can fix and prevent long-term injuries down the road when they are then elite athletes. Um, I know we always talk about Robert Griffin III. Yeah. I mean, so that could have been easily prevented, his, his movement dysfunctions, and no one saw it. Um, and I think he's really what started the, um, they do a huge job at the combine of, pulling every piece and every file from that person and basically analyzing everything. And now they're looking a lot more into the movement patterns aspect rather than, you know, just the, the heart rate, the blood pressure, you know, doing scans of bone density and, and different things that they're doing for those athletes. Um, so it's really cool where, where, uh, where everything's going now. So. And I think this is, this stuff is important year round, obviously. But this is a time of year when we always really sit down and reanalyze how we're doing with this stuff. Because I think one of the biggest issues that I see across transitioning at every level is the season gets done and we just jump right into the off season and training and, and, and not necessarily thinking about, well, these dudes just got the shit beat out of them for 20 straight weeks and there is gonna be joint dysfunction. There is gonna be imbalance and one of the things that we try to do a really good job of is, is when our guys get back, figuring out what that is, what what's your issue so that we're not, we don't start a bilateral squat progression on a guy that's, you know, 60% on one leg or has yeah. joint dysfunction. Yeah, DM on the right. right. Yeah, um, and oh yeah, so the, those movements, those movements specific to football, sometimes aren't gonna cross over very well to an off-season training. So there's gotta be a gap where you spend some time with your high school, college, and NFL athletes I've seen on all three levels after seasons um, where you got to really take this into consideration. So I think this is a, a final okay. time um, to do this, this episode, especially as we start to you know get close to hitting you know, an off season. 
as you guys kind of move along to your next internships and um, you see these athletes, that's really one thing you want to look for. Uh, and we talk about things that separate yourself. This is a big thing that separates yourself. If, if when you get to Maryland and you can sit, sit there and start to analyze and see, oh wow, his his right ankle mobility is not as you know, it's, it's, it's a much lesser degree than his left, and that's causing him to to shift this way. And you can start to see those things and not only see them but correct them. Um, it's incredible. So it's gonna make you look really good too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So. Um, I don't, do you want to, just want to kind of start with, with what I think is essentially important, is your general philosophy of how you assess movement and um, joint by joint? And yeah, absolutely. Um, so I take it a little farther than what I would say a strength and conditioning coach should do. Um, obviously with SFMA, which FMS is the, uh, the version that you guys do. I do the clinician side of it, which is SFMA. So essentially, whenever someone does an FMS screen and there's pain, that's when you typically send to the, the clinician side. Um, and not always, but that's typically the, the rule of thumb. Um, but how I break it down is I always start with the foot. And especially with football players or track athletes, um, anyone that does a lot of you know, volume on their feet, they're, they're destroyed. And they, they never have ever looked at anything about their feet. They focus on their knees, you know, pushing out, they focus on chest staying up in the squat, chest, you know, good position everywhere. No one focuses on the foot. And, and that's where all things start. Um, you know, when you don't have that stability in the midfoot, obviously, if, if you've done the joint by joint approach, you know, uh, stability at the midfoot, mobility at the ankle, stability at the knee, mobility at the hip, and we'll just stop there. Um, so analyzing people when they're doing their warm-up drills, when they're doing their, you know, um, bench, squat, whatever they're doing in a row, that's where you look at these things. So for example, the midfoot, um, you know, getting people in their bare, bare foot and just having them walk around and do a lot of stuff uh, right after season and just check those imbalances. I like to do a lot of unilateral stuff because if they are, you know, I'll talk a lot about football today because you guys are the strengths for the football team. Um, if they are a football player, for example, an offensive lineman for a spread offense, if they are constantly pass rushing and they're on the left side, they're really going to have an overdeveloped one-sided glute, typically the right, because they're constantly pushing off that right leg. So if you get them into a unilateral lunge when they're using their left leg for the dominant glute, you know, that's going to really, you're going to see huge differences uh, opposed to when they're the right side, they're going to be solid. Um, and, and again, that, that's going back up into the uh, upper part of the leg. But starting again back at the foot, if you have someone with a collapsed arch, so they don't have that, you know, that nice arch in the foot, um, predominantly, you know, it's, uh, a lot of people are predisposed to that. And you could have a collapsed arch, uh, but it's not necessarily, you're not necessarily going to get that arch to grow and come all the way back. However, you can build integrity to that foot so it can withstand all of that compression and uh, just smashing all year long during the football season. Uh, so do you want me to like, analyze someone right now or? Oh, I, just, just off that, and this is something that I have a question. This is, this is a full body, but we're just specifically talking about the foot right now. So like an anatomical disposition, um, how much of that do you feel like you can actually correct? Um, whether, whether it be a hip, the, just the way the femur sits inside the, the hip capsule, mm -hmm. um, whether it be the fact that collapsed arch, you know, like I said, most African-American athletes, yeah. they have freaking collapsed arch. Yeah. If you look at your athletes, and, um, and you guys can start to do this, but go look at your black athletes and look at their feet, and the majority of them are going to have collapsed arches, and that's going to internally rotate their yeah. hips, and that's going to have them walk the relatively valgus, mm -hmm. you know, position. Um, but you know, obviously you do a lot of drills um, to create that stability mm -hmm. uh, in that midfoot. I guess when you're doing that realistically and you see like, you know, like Jatavis, you know, collapsed arch, how, I guess, what are you looking for and how much do you think that you can actually make a difference when there is a legitimate anatomical disposition? I think I make a huge difference in, in regards to not anatomically changing that arch because that's really hard to do. Right. However, if that athlete was to continue that way for years, whether they you know they ended up having an ACL tear or uh, FAI hip impingement, 
Um, if none of that happened, you know, then they're still going to lead to having arthritis in their foot. Right. Um, and we've never really talked about this, but uh, when you have that collapsed arch, yes, you're going to have you know issues at the ankle, issues at the knee, and just really big issues at the hip. Um, over time, if that athlete does not learn how to walk correctly and activate that small foot um, or midfoot, then they'll they'll form a bunion because. Um, and it's kind of hard for to show this in the video, but if I have a collapsed arch and I toe off, when I toe off, I'm going to be pressing in a valgus position on that toe. That is really how you create a bunion. And so long-term effects down the road, they are going to have those issues that can be prevented. So I think anatomically and long-term, I think that's a huge uh, thing that I can change and not have them having those issues um, from having that position. But um, in the small foot itself, uh, you know, you, you aren't going to lift that navicular. And the navicular is a little bone right here um, that drops when that arch is collapsed. Um, but you can build strength so it doesn't get worse. Because a lot of times they don't have a completely collapsed arch. They might have, you know, a lot of people do right. that. Um, and again, it's, it's really about building the durability of the foot. So if you can teach them to activate that muscle that they've never activated in their life, they have no idea. Usually, I would say 90% of people, that's approximately 99% of people, don't know how to activate that intrinsic small foot. Right. So when you teach them how to do that, that immediately changes how they walk, how they move, um, how they basically do everything. Yeah. So I think structurally that, that will do a huge difference. Not necessarily <coughs> building the arch back into the foot, but putting you in the right position so you don't have breakdown of different joints. So you can almost as much as strength neuromuscular yes. patterning as well. And there's the pathway that you've literally, uh, and you've seen me work with those guys before, I mean, they, they, they don't know how to fire it. So if people get frustrated, these professional athletes, they don't know how to activate a muscle. And it is frustrating, but you know, you have to just be patient and try to learn and re-ingrain that motor pattern to learn how to, to do it. I see more of you trying. <laughs> um, I mean, and I, the big thing that I guess when I really took away from Chad, we really started talking about this a few years ago, is is we talk about everything as a chain, and everything starts from the foot and stems up, but everything is a chain and it starts from the foot and it works its way up, and little little things like and and, and what what he's talking about, if you guys can't see exactly, he's talking about this part of the foot. Yep. So it's the small intrinsic part of the foot here. It's not the global flexors of, of the foot, which go up into the calf, which a lot of people will try to do. They'll try to squeeze with the toes when doing this movement. But it's really using this little small, uh, this knuckle on, on your big toe to, to bring that foot into the right position. And when that happens, look how, I mean, if you face the camera, Um, so what happens is when his arch is collapsed, it literally causes the entire chain to change. And when he puts that foot in the right position, literally brings everything and puts them in the right hand side position, knee tracking over, you know, last two toes. Um, and a fun fact, the navicular is Latin for navigate. So wherever this bone goes, your body goes. So if that bone drops, your whole body drops or the whole leg internally rotates. When it raises, it brings it into that right position. And so when when he does toe off and, and gait or in walking, he's not, you know, he's gonna put that pressure on that toe and put it into that, you know, valgus position for that bone, which leads to the bunion and arthritis in that joint, um, so opposed to towing off and having a lot more power output by driving off the foot and the toe in the, in the, um, the right plane. There's a lot of research coming out on just you know, big toe mobility and extensibility and having uh, the right mobility in this joint for po power output. Yeah, and you, you need a little word there. Have you, uh, this is off topic, but have you, like, we were reading, um, or maybe listening to some of, uh, what was his name? Tre uh, tri the training, Cal Beats. And he was talking about big foot, or uh, big toe mobility mm -hmm. and glute activation. Yep. And how just like by like the bottom of the squat, by pressing your toe into the ground, you get more, more glute glute activation mm -hmm. and the firing pattern is correct mm -hmm. where you go glute, low back, hamstring. Yeah. Because again, a lot of times coaches, you know, it's it's great that coaches are cueing knees out 
because when I was, you know, going through school, that never wasn't even a cue then. Um, but if, if they're coaching these out, that's still awesome. But that's just basically from here down, just neglecting everything right. down there. You're not thinking about that at all. If you activate your feet the correct way, your knees will track the correct way. You don't have to worry about that. Right. Um, and if when you do have these issues with the with the ankle, people don't think about, you know, they just think about hip, knee, and ankle. That's really what causes anterior pelvic tilt. So when you see people walking around with that big arse in their back, you know, they'll just do all these dead bug and all these exercises. But if, if you don't fix the foot, they're not going to be able to get their glutes to activate the right way to get them out of that anterior pelvic tilt, which is huge. It's another, you know. So that's what the issue is when the small foot, you can't contract or contract that small foot you have left glute activation. That's what causes yep. pelvic tilt. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I guess correct it. What, so like if, if, you, if you're walking around and you, you realize, you look in the mirror and you realize that you're collapsed over here and your femur is internally rotated and you're internally rotated at the hip, how do I start fixing that? So that, that's going to be, you know, I don't know how often or how regularly you can pull someone on that. Um, you could do that globally, you know, in your entire um, team and teach them small, small foot activation. Just give them um, that ability because even if they don't have issues anywhere, it's still good for them to know how to do and activate their small foot as an athlete and as a human being. Um, so how I start that is single foot um, unloaded. So I'll have them s sit down. So we'll sit on a bench and I'll have them try this seated and get that small foot activated. Um, it's a lot okay. uh, so seated, unloaded, and then uh, unilateral. And then you can do both, seated, unloaded. And then you stand, do loaded, single, and then you stand and do loaded, uh, lateral. And then you can add resistance bands um, to do that. So I'm pretty sure we've done this one before, that's not enough. <coughs> and again, if this isn't realistic for you know your staff, find someone that that you know, if you don't have the time to do this with your athletes, find someone that, you know, this person has this issue probably should refer, refer them to some sports specialist in the area that can do this if you don't have that time. Um, so I'm going to put this around the ankle so it gives a downward traction and then this will around the mid. But he's going to spread his feet and what it's going to do, actually I messed it up. That was wrong. I meant around the mid but there we go. So this is going to give a downward traction of that navicular pulling him into that collapsed arch. Just like when we do monster walks and put bands around the knees. But this is specific to that navicular. So it's tractioning down, and then it's just giving him a little resistance to learn how to build that, that small foot. Crazy thing is, is like when, you, when I do this, like you can feel your hips raise and align. Like when you, when you push, when you're pushing that valgus position, you can feel your hips push up and back. You can feel that, that pelvic tilt. And you can feel all that tension, you can feel the impingement in the hip, you can feel the valgus in the knee and on the foot. And then as soon as you create that small arch, you feel your hips raise, you feel your femur shift down that hip capsule, you feel your knee align, and you, you feel stability. And just, this, that, that's just a great example of understanding that not only are, are people walking around like this, but some of our athletes are producing max effort power like this. So you wonder why we have hip issues, why we have hip impingement, why we have low back pain. Imagine putting yourself in this position where some of us, you're, you're a little flat with a red green, yeah. and trying to produce forces, and you wonder why you have a pelvic tilt, you wonder why you have hip impingement, you wonder why you have joint dysfunction, you wonder why you have pain, and then you start to realize, like I said, these are, this is what clicked in my head when I was like, damn, T, <coughs> I, I mean, I'm the first time you're talking about the small foot, I'm like, all right, dude, we're, we're, we're in college football, there's a lot bigger issues in the freaking foot, okay? And they're really not, because you think about how much of it just stems from this. Now, obviously, there's other issues which we'll go through here next, but how much stuff you can correct and, and, and align by just correcting the foot or teaching how to neurologically fire your foot has been insane. So this is something that, for me, when, when you first talked to me about it, I was kind of like, okay, next. Like, the foot, I get it. The foot, I get it. Like, oh, we're all supposed to take a softball and roll up our foot. I get it. Team, thanks, bro. But when I really started listening and started really applying it and feeling, like then you're like, okay, tell me more about the foot yeah. Like, tell me why this is so important. And then you see, you know, those explosive athletes 
that are in those horrible, horrible positions, arch backs, when they're down, you know, in their three foot stance, and they're already extremely powerful. And you just correct a couple of these things, and it takes them just, you know, through the roof and, and power up. But okay, so foot, we all get on the foot. Does anyone have any more questions on that? It's crazy that you bring that up because, like, I'm flat foot and was really bad pigeon toe, <clears throat> and like I've been dealing with like this hip thing for like ever. So you know. It, Makes sense. Well, I mean, and then, you know, uh, this is a quick little, just, you know, visualize in your head. You have athletes, and this, all training staff should know this, because a lot of times they don't do it. They get knee ACL surgeries, post ACL, and they just, all they look at is the knee, yeah. and they try to rehab that knee back to normal. They don't look at the foot to see, you know, did they get that ACL tear, because the mechanism of injury for ACL tear is here. So, you know, do they not have small foot activation? Can they, do they not have that durability in the foot? Um, you know, focus above and below the chain and not just where the injury happens because that's probably not what caused the injury, yeah. especially if it's non-contact. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a movement pattern dysfunction, 100%. And that's one thing, I'm mean, asking a big thing too that, that I've, I've taken away is uh, there, and athletes, we, we talk about like athletes don't, a lot of times they don't know what's actually hurt. Like they'll come in and they'll say, sleep, my, my, hip, my hip hurts. But it's really, uh, I'll release their psoas and their quad, and all of a sudden they have no more hip pain. Yeah, so it's like, it wasn't your hip, dude. But like, a lot of times, athletes will come and say, hey, my hamstring hurts, I need a hamstring stretch. And strength coach will just pop on the ground and say, okay, I was working your hamstrings. But yeah, it's, in, the in, in, instead you need to look what's underneath, what's, what's, what, what might be causing reciprocal inhibition, what might be causing something underneath or above ascending, descending, and then you can really start correcting the issues, you know? like. Sometimes athletes will be like, like I said, they'll come in and they'll, they'll want something. I'll start, you know, rolling out their adductor magnus, and they're like, "Sleep, that's not what hurts." And I'm like, "Shut up, lay there, just, just <laughs> give us." And they'll get up and they'll go, "Oh my god, I can't believe it." Um, big toe stuff. So you, uh, that's one thing I haven't really heard much about from you. So, what are you? So how would I know looking at my athletes? What isn't mobile enough? And then what do you do for big toe mobility? So big toe mobility is is pretty, you know. General, just having the ability to lift that toe up off the ground is huge. A lot of times you'll see people that have that valgus uh, or bunion forming, um, yeah. and the, the toe will go up in that way. And that's just developing poor tendon um, strength because it's, it's basically <clears throat> stressing that out. You're more prone to getting turf toe, you're more prone to getting you know a lot of pain in that area, getting very inflamed. So first I just, you know, you have people sit there and just try to work on being able to lift that toe straight up in the air. And then, um, you know, you want to have, it, and it's variable on the degree of how far you should be able to get that toe up um, uh, passively. So just being able to generally get it up past 45 degrees, I usually say. Um, some people are going to have more. Some people you're going to go like this, and it's, it's going to be like this. Especially because, you know, athletes are constantly pressing off that toe in the opposite direction. So you build so much tension in that tendon, it's not going to... to essentially come up so then you get that you get jammed a lot because you don't have that mobility in that toe because when they, when you land in a weird way when that toe would normally go back it doesn't so you jam the crap out of it so a quick mobility tool that I need to do more often too is setting that patient up for that athlete and having them in this position and then starting here and obviously as the coach making sure they're not doing this because that's gonna just put, put them in that forward position, making sure they're here. So starting here, bring them down to their toes and just have them work this position. Obviously the end goal is to be able to get here. It's very uncomfortable. One side's usually gonna be worse than the other. My right one's worse than my other. So you'll feel a deep stretch in that tendon all the way up into probably your heel. So um, just working, you know, the rule, rule of thumb, two minutes uh, for tissue change to occur. Just, you know, Simple mobility right there. And just making sure they're not putting their foot cocked out in that weird position. Did you wear those socks today when you were running? What's all the socks? Nice, dude. Oh, I, I, I'm a sock guy. <laughs> <laughs> These are my least color, colorful ones. I like it. Um, but back to midfoot as well. Um, teaching the midfoot is extremely important. Uh, if they do have a flat foot, making sure they have some sort of support on that foot is, is, is just as important. But it's like wearing a weight belt. You know, you want to have that, that support, but you also want to have that strength. So there's a funny balance, there's a good balance of, you know, 
if you wear that all day and you walk around at home and now you're going to go back into that position and never have that strength build. If you were, you know, wear a belt all day during the weight uh, in the weight room, then you're going to build that core stability, core strength. So prescription for anybody who's got small foot, anybody watching, or if these guys want to start correcting small foot issues, what was your prescription? I would say find someone that can get you a insert, um, moldable, uh, something that will help just give you a little bit of sport. I don't know, cleat wise or um, you know any shoe wise in in, uh, in the sports world now uh, that has good support. I know more about running shoes, I would say. Um, but finding a support a shoe that supports your foot, having someone just analyze it and be able to tell, all right, this shoe's gonna be better for you. Uh, and then obviously doing that small foot activation at least two times a day for a month until you get that ingrained in. You can do it at school or at work when you're sitting at your desk, it's the best time because you're seated and it's easier. Sets and reps? Um, you know, it's simple. Three to three sets of ten, you know, it's typical. Just just twice to have a, day, a number. Twice a day, three by ten, start seating, making sure you're doing it correctly and yeah. work up to the banded variation. Yeah. Three by ten twice a day, yeah. put orthotics in, and you start seeing a big difference. Yeah, and uh, you know, make sure that you, you, a lot of times people will be like, oh, I don't know if I'm doing that right because it's cramp. You that's a good thing. If right. it starts cramping. That's a, that's a really good indication that you're doing it correctly. There's a fine line of having it, you know, the right way and the wrong way. So, oh, I keep taking my shoes off, but this is the wrong way. Just squeezing your toes is not how you do it. It's very, very subtle. The small foot activation is very subtle, and it's just, you don't have to move your knee out. If I'm just in here unloaded, it's gonna be like this. And you'll just see right along here, this muscle will contract. Yeah. Okay, um, and you know, also if you have someone with tendonitis issues in their Achilles, which is a common thing now, um, or has been for a while, check small foot always. You know, and then obviously when it's a tendonitis issue, isometric, e, uh, eccentric, and concentric loading for your progressions. So. Here's another next one up, ankle dysfunction. Ankle dysfunction. A uh, quick indicator for ankle mobility issues, which it's it's really <coughs> it is an issue, but it's it's overlooked more than actually you know that's focused on too much opposed to actually breaking right. to the foot. Right. Because a lot of times when we when we test for ankle mobility, so I'll have someone put a fist uh, against the wall. So I'm gonna have a fist here. I'm gonna have you. Basically go like this, and you have to keep your arch in your foot. If you, because a lot of times we'll want to, you know, we can gain extra mobility in the ankle by dropping that arch and going and go a lot farther. So you have to make sure you have this, even doing a small foot, and then taking that knee over the last two toes and driving it to that wall, watching for that heel to come up. Because that heel will come up um, when you have that ankle dysfunction. But you'll see a lot of people just try to go here. I don't know if you can see that in the video, but they'll bring the knee in, collapse the arch, and then you can go a lot farther um, because that's a movement dysfunction that's so being generated. So you don't have to tell them to get small foot, but just you know, have just watch their arch and be like, hey, you know, if if you see if you start to see this movement go whoosh, like this, then that's wrong. Making sure you take that straight in line, boom, knee should be able to touch the wall. And, and then you get into all kinds of, if, if you can, if you get to this person and they're like this, you know, that's, that's poor ankle mobility. And that could be anything from lack of flexibility from the tendons and structures behind the heel, and that could be an actual structural issue in that mortise joint, um, or the jo uh, joint right here. Basically, you have your talus and your tibia, and that Tip that talus is supposed to slide under as that tibia comes up, and a lot of times it's popped up and it, it, it inhibits that ability to happen. So you lose that range of motion. So that's why you see a lot of people with those banded things where they're pulling that talus down, they're trying to go into the range of motion. Um, you know, that's gonna be, that's, you know, a lot more time sensitive for you guys. That's stuff you could just teach them real quick. You know, if it's not working, just send it to someone that can really Move just distract it. What? Distraction or anything? Distraction of the ankle, yeah. You know, and then you can get people to, you can get them to put the bands, uh, mobility booty bands are amazing for that. 
um, just strapping that thing on there, and then um, I really like that one where. So I'll have someone basically put this here, and we'll come back. I'll sit back like this, so where it's comfortable for me to sit here. And then what I'm going to do is get my ankle in a little bit of dorsiflexion. I can I can put a plate under here if I want to work on it a little more too. And then what I'm going to do is just shear these tissues back and forth. You can see that. I'm just shearing these tissues with the band. I'm going to pull and shear with the voodoo band on. So you can do this. Shearing back and forth, move it up, shear back and forth, and then I can drive over, move. And it's really just restoring the sliding surface of the tissues. You have you know, your gastroxoleus, Achilles, um, deep flexor tendons, everything that runs um, basically on top of each other. And you have all this fascia or spider web material that you know, when we're constantly using them and jumping and running and sprinting, they get really stuck and sticky. So restoring those sliding surfaces are huge for just having you know, no dysfunctions. Um, and then once I clear a lot of this out, across all the foot, a lot of times it'll just you know, open up that ankle mobility. When do you decide to do dorsiflexion or not though? Just depending on the mobility or? Dorsiflexion on like? Like with this, like you said you put a plate underneath. Oh, um, uh, that's just like a progression. So, you know, more advanced because this might be enough for you right now. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel anything from it, you can put a plate under there and then it just, it gives you a little more um, just resistance, I guess, into putting you into that position and you can go farther. Opposed to me like leaning way over like this to try to get it, right. it just makes it a little easier. I can just stay back and, and work on that tissue. Mm -hmm. Let's say, um, so let's say we're back squatting and a co how can coaches recognize if they don't have time to get people down, they're a high school strength coach, they have 30 minutes, how can they recognize, I guess, movement dysfunction that would say, all right, this guy has ankle and mobility, we need to work on this. What would, what would you see in that movement pattern? What would I see in that movement? I would see an uh, athlete, you know, and it might be disguised as ankle mobility, but it, you know, that's where it gets fishy, because right. when I see a, an athlete lifting and I see them going on their heels, it's, or on their toes, it looks like ankle mobility, and that is a huge mistake sometimes because that could just be the fault. That's like saying, I want a front rack, my wrists are, you know, I should just mobilize my wrists. Well, no, it's usually, you know, lats and the subscat that's not allowing you to get in that position, so the wrist is taking more of a breath. So if they don't have good squatting position and they go down in this position, they're, they're obviously going to go into onto their toes because they don't have, you know, enough range of motion to have that. Some people have enough range of motion and can do that, but it's still a dysfunctional squat, which is, is bad, because then you'll see those athletes have huge quads and little hamstrings. They have great mobility in their ankles, and they can just drop straight down and do a squat. Um, but then there's a lot of people that don't have that, so when they go into that same squat they try to do, you'll see them come up on their on their toes. So I know that was not probably the answer you wanted, but... It's the answer um, that most people need, though. Yeah, so people will see that, and they'll be like, oh, you need ankle mobility immediately. Well, no. Their knees are straight ahead, they're, just, they're not opening, they're not activating their glutes so their pelvis can sit back. Um, oh, it can be hips, it can be ankles, it can be small foot. And again, usually small foot solves all of those, um, at least to some degree. So. Does anything else on the ankle? Yeah, so you get some guys going through ankle mobility where they want to do like that three way ankle. Where you had track on the big big toe, middle foot, and the small toe. You were just telling us not to go around. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on this? So, what are they doing? So, so like when you're falling, you, you will probably track your your knee over your your small toe, okay. straight to the middle, and then going to the inside. What are your I, thoughts on I that? personally wouldn't have an athlete try to gain mobility in a valgus position, okay. um, especially for the foot, because then you're just building more flexibility into a dysfunctional pattern. Um, make sense? Yeah. yeah, so like, if I'm doing this, yeah, I'll get some mobility, but then I'm gonna, it's gonna be that much easier for me to get into that position if I'm failing. It might not happen, you know, in the first, if it's like a, you know, a smaller, smaller sprint, um, but if it's, you know, endurance, they might start collapsing into that position a lot easier. But a lot of these things don't happen right away. That's why I like that you do this post-season, because 
you know, if you, most, most times when these issues come out is, you know, when they're tired. Right. So, um, you know, if, if someone's doing like a metabolic conditioning workout, or they're just working for a long period of time, that's where they really have the movement dysfunction that just kind of pop up. Or someone can do a good squat for 30 reps, but you get into that 40, 50 threshold, and then boom, they start collapsing, things are fatiguing. So, you know, that's really important in like a marathon runner or, um, you know, a cross country distance runner. Because a lot of times they're like, oh man, it, it really starts hurting mile three, you know. And, uh, or, you know, it's not, it's not usually the first, sometimes it's the first mile, sometimes it's the third mile. But if you're stretching, you know, range of motion into a dysfunctional pattern, uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. So, you know, if, if there's something out there that proves, proves that wrong, you know, I'd love to read it. But, um, personally, I, I would always try to teach them, you know, to get into that better position. So if I'm stretching in this position, I'm activating this position, um, then I'm always going to try to, I'm, basically gonna run in that position as much as possible. It's gonna keep you there as long as possible. What about with the uh, Achilles? Is anything from the foot about that? Achilles? Yeah, so you yeah, have like just pain. Pain in the Achilles? Yeah. Um, so I, I got a couple nasty little mobilities with uh, two lacrosse balls. Um, just, you kind of just what's that? Roll it out. Yeah, so uh, Achilles is again a fault uh, injury. Um, or it, it gets all the fault. It, it's not usually the Achilles. I mean, it could be if you're like a runner that just continually runs. Um, I recently had some tendonitis in my Achilles and uh, just changing my shoe angle uh, helped clear it up a lot faster. You know, I was, I was treating, I treated it and I fixed it. And then I went to the CrossFit Games and walked a million miles that weekend and then it just came back with vengeance. Uh, so treating it, the, the next best thing that helped keep it away was the angle <coughs> on my um, shoe. <coughs> the shoe, because a lot of times with training shoes, they're usually zero. Yeah. They don't have uh, like agility stuff. I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, running shoes have a, a higher angle. Um, and then more, usually, athletic stability shoes are, are flat angle. So, if you're walking around in those shoes all day, and I, you know, even if it's millimeter lift, that's putting a lot more tension on my on my core every step I take. So just elevating that heel a little bit, and these shoes are amazing for that. Um, those Adidas, Adi Star, Adi Boost, whatever they call them, those are really good shoes. Um, and they put you in a really good position because you guys are sponsored by. Oh, we have Nikes for here. That's a fine coach. Is that not allowed to be on camera? Yeah. Sure. The assistants have no excuse. The interns got you a little bit. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, uh, just changing that angle a little bit is going to help that cord. Uh, dress shoes are not the best for that because it's locked. I should not have on the Achilles. And then a double lacrosse ball move. Got to go grab them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you got some some man cast there. Uh, so what we do is we have a lot of rigidity in these muscles. If you're standing all day long, you know, regardless, you have the big muscle groups, okay? Those get tight and, and whatever, but these deep ones under the tibia that you can't ever stretch or get to very easily. Ooh, okay, relax that. That's not terrible. No, it's good. All right, you were just being tense. All right, so what we're gonna do, what did you say he was? Tense. Tense. Yeah. Oh. Coach Green, tense? Yeah. Tense. I've never heard that before. <laughs> no, I've never heard that before either. Wow. <laughs> Alright, so. <laughs> you're going to be in this position. Chew your pose. Okay. And take one look cross ball. You're going to put it on your peroneal muscles or the fibularis, whatever you want to call them. Everyone's changed them. Um, and you're going to go basically compress into that. Mm. Okay. You're going to take the other ball. Mm. And you're going to basically smash right off the bone, oh, yeah. cool. and you're gonna come directly above that. And that is how we're going to compress those tissues between that you can't normally stretch, okay? I'm not taking a picture of your package right now, I promise. <laughs> no bulge. <laughs> 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 All right, and then what I'm gonna do is flex and extend that foot to restore the range of motion, okay? These are, these are called ABCs. <laughs> 
Yeah. And that ball pressures. Yeah. So what you're gonna do again? The peroneal muscles are directly lateral there, and then you're gonna bring this foot up a little bit because your hamstrings and calf pop out right there. You're gonna come right off of that tibia bone. Come off of that and down. And you flex and extend that foot. Yeah. This is magic. How often do you suggest doing um, something like this? I think this would be a great thing. For, for athletes, all, all athletes, not even just football, yeah. just to kind of occasionally, even when it's on their feet a lot, track athletes, yeah. you know. Anybody who complains about like shin splints or anything? Yeah, shin splints, this is amazing. Relax, Gary. Really? I can't. Why not? Obviously, if it's a if it's a shin splint where they're getting those, if it's a, a chronic reoccurring true stress fracture, this might be a little sensitive, and you don't want to get on that bone, because that's basically where, you know, the, the Muscles pulling that periosteum is just causing the pain. Right. Um, but gently, you're just releasing these tissues. And then, what you're going to do is you're going to drop one ball's length down, and you're going to do this one directly above again. You're going to flex and extend the foot. You like it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's going to feel so good. Can you use something like a tennis ball? Like, um, or? Yeah, it, it's, it's not going to do as. as it because mm -hmm. essentially what you're trying to do is you have you know take the gastroc take the soles and the gastroc off and then under that you know when you're stretching you can't really get that you just feel like it's your Achilles and your, your calf so what you're doing is you're pressing those tissues together and you're running them through the range of motion right. and that is again going to restore that sliding surface mm -hmm. which is key You can do this all the way from, like, you know, right at the knee crease down, um, all the way to about the ankle to where you feel, you know, comfortable. Yeah, that's a good one. I do, uh, I do five to ten uh, flexion extension of the foot at each spot. You know, lead more towards ten at the spot that hurts the worst, because that's obviously a more restricted area. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah, I'll start crying. Um, right, what's just keep going on with the chain? Knee dysfunction. Knee dysfunction. All right, so the biggest knee dysfunctions I get, you know, you have big fancy words, you have plica, also conurbulation patella, which are two things where you get jumped behind the kneecap from poor motor pattern and right. movement dysfunctions um, that lead you to have those issues. Um, <laughs> And then you have uh, tracking issues, so that patella tracking in an improper way, and that also movement pattern uh, dysfunction. So, really, what you got to focus on the knees bruised today, because I did. Uh, you ever seen those you know, those inflatable balls you get in and you run into smash? Well, I did that this weekend. So <laughs> it was fun. It was like oh, it was really fun. You guys should do that as a staff. Uh, it doesn't hurt at all. I just banged my knees once because I was, I was pulling out of it. Um, but anyways, so tracking disorders. Um, let me get some little shorts. There we go. So we usually nowadays have, uh, I'm going to say I'm just there, do it up a little bit. There we go. So, um, we tend to have underdeveloped VMOs, medial quad, um, but you know, that is pretty well known. People talk about it a lot, but no one really talks about the uh, fascia. I'm really big with fascia. You always hear me say it. Um, the fascia where the IT band and the lateral quad kind of superimpose each other. And the, the lateral quad mm -hmm. comes out on this side of the IT band. So face the camera a little bit. So. You have this IT band that runs down, which everyone thinks that you should foam roll all the time, and that is not correct. Tons of research has been shown, you've read it. Um, you can't foam roll the IT band, so it's going to cause you a lot of pain. Um, but the main issue is typically, you know, you get the IT problem, but then it goes into the lateral knee. Okay? So, what I do a lot of times is I take and I clear with a cross ball, which we'll get that back out. Um, and you clear the sliding surface between the IT band and the lateral quad. This one sucks really bad, this one's worse than that one. 
Um, you got tenderness through here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right now. So, so really the goal is to restore that sliding surface, strengthen the BMO, and this is specifically to tracking disorders. So meaning that patella is getting pulled out of that uh, track. So if this, the patella is a train, it's in this train tracks. If one side's stronger than the other, it's going to pull that train out of the tracks. It's going to piss it off. Um, then you get pain down here, you get pain in the IT band, which again can also be fixed with small foot if they're not tracking correctly. Um, so, uh, so if they have a lot of pain here, you know, I'm always going to treat the pain, but then I'm always going to look downstream and upstream to see if I can fix it somewhere else. So, if you grab that little red ball in there, we right. put one. What's that? Right down next to you, other side. Oh, there it is. Oh, you know where the roll back. Um, <laughs> Ooh. All right, so you're going to lay on the ground, and this is a quick release for the lateral quad. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place it here. Again, in the IT band, it's that thick structure there, and I come just outside of that or medial towards that. And I'm going to push it into the ground. And this one you could use a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. um, this one's aggressive, and it, it's, it hurts. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm going to put my foot over, so I'm going here to here. Now I'm tilting my pelvis so I get right onto that quad. Then I put all my weight up here. Put all my weight up. And then I'm going to flex, fix, in that leg. Okay? So. And then in, in that spot, you're going to bring your right leg to here. You're going to put all your weight up there. <coughs> for any knee issue it just reinforces you know and that's just a good preventative exercise to do what's your like people do three-way tkes like for pain to start like they'll, they'll distract immediately and then they'll do tk like do you see any benefit to that or do you just always right behind the knee straight ahead just right behind the knee yeah. i mean I, you know i, I mean, never i just never really got it i never understood why you do it from any different angle i mean it, it's if you put a really thin band on it, and you had <laughs> like a DV doing some backup drills, and you put it in different directions, I can see where that would help more, you know, right. tensile of the ligaments of the knee. But for patella tracking specifically, I'm gonna want it to be directly behind so I can get because I want to again, I want to train in perfect position at all time. So when I go out in the field, if I do go valgus on a on a jump, or if I do go valgus when I'm back coming and stopping. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna break down. So practice in perfect form at all times. Um, that way, when you you can deviate out of that when you're in competition. Um, but yeah, no, I don't see any any reason to do that. And that's when you're talking about stretching that ankle. You know, going into that position, you're you're stretching it into a dysfunctional way. You know, it'd be like stretching your knee. You know, going like this and doing like a W stretch, falling back. Yeah. I'm stretching my knee in a box position. Like, why would you ever want to do that? It's not beneficial. In my opinion. Um, Patella tendonitis with infra supra. What, what are your, <coughs> what are your, Say that again. Patella tendonitis, what are your correctives for that? Whether it's below the knee, above the knee? Below the knee, above the knee. Below the knee, above the knee. Below the knee, above the knee. You know, really focus on the TK, getting that tracking correctly. Um, <coughs> Typically, when you get that tendonitis up here, I usually release the quad up top. That's a good one. Um, but, you know, clearing this out, and then obviously in progressions, I'm gonna load it isometrics, then eccentrics, then concentrics. You know, and that's not like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's like week, week to week. Always start with isometrics. Build, build a little strength there, and then eccentrics. And then you know eccentrics to a certain position um, or a certain degree, 
and eccentric to a farther degree, specifically to the knee. Um, and that's when you can be pulling it in different positions or different um, ranges of motion with bands. Um, but then again, always going back to tendonitis or any injury and looking at how they move and making sure that, that is efficient and not causing the tendonitis. Um, you know, and then you can put chart char out braces. Sorry. What? The, the braces. Oh, you yeah. Those doing that help. All that does is tendonitis is a really inflamed area where all of your quads insert on one spot. So when that's pulling, you know, over and over and over and over again, when your quads are too strong, obviously strengthening the hamstrings if you have tendonitis in the knee, you do a lot of hamstring stuff and stuff. But um, what that charcot brace will do is it gives you a little bit of relief because it gives your muscles a different um, insertion to pull from because it's a little higher and it pushes in so your, your body's pulling more from that spot rather than it pulling directly from um, the insertion. Same thing here. So if you put a charcot brace, that muscle is going to have a little more um, pull from that, that spot of the brace rather than pulling all that tension off of the bone. What? Have you ever done any release stuff like with the tibialis anterior? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's more into that. I'll do, I'll release the tibia, I'll release the quads a little bit, and then I'll do the hamstring strength. Tibialis anterior is really important because again, downstream also connects into that area. Right. I, I haven't done a ton of that, but that's probably definitely start doing more of that. And that's just lacrosse ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can just <clears throat> sit in here and just have them sit, and then I kind of cross my leg like this, and then I just lean back and forth. Because if I have my foot on the ground, it's like wobbly, I can't really get it. So this just gives me like a, I don't know the correct word, but fulcrum, I was gonna say fulcrum, but I don't know if that's I the right word. Either, but it sounds <laughs> right. Science. So you say with confidence yeah. that you're good to So go. give me a fulcrum. <laughs> that's literally what I was gonna say. Yeah, great mind saying like this. <laughs> um, anybody have anything on the knee? Questions on the knee? Also, um, back of the knee. Is a huge popliteus. Yeah, that's a huge uh, issue that causes anterior pain, posterior pain, and you can you can distract that knee. Um, just you know, just give a little decompression to it by putting your hand in there and then just sitting back, and that give that'll give you some relief. It'll basically decompress that joint, just open it up so water can get in and out. Um, and then uh, voodoo. Again, you know that when I do the voodoo below the knee and above the knee, so it gives that flexion gap of the anterior capsule. Yep. That's a good one. Distraction, um, wrapping your ankle up, and just sitting there. So, here, I'll do is the wrap. Just kind of get my ankle completely strapped in there. Then I just fall back, so here, Fall on my back, fall on this side, and just let it, and just relax and let the, just distract me. Distract me, yeah. It'll give, I mean, if I'm on this side too, it'll give me a little hip distraction. But, if you want to sit, really get the knee, I'm going to sit on this hip so it focuses more on the knee. So we're going to do a full from. Yeah, full from. It's all about the full <laughs> um, Alright, you want to go, speaking of train tracks, you want to go up to the hip? <laughs> yeah! The hip is the one of the seven wonders of the world. Yeah. Um, so hips. Do you want to talk about FAI? You want to talk about? Absolutely, FAI for sure. Okay, um, so um, we'll start there. Pelvic tilt. Pelvic tilt. Which tilt. we already kind of did. Yeah. So something we previously hit was pelvic tilt. Um, on with uh, collapsed arches. It's like we talked about, when your arches collapse, it causes internal rotation. This is obviously. A dramatic version of what happens, but even you know that that one millimeter of, of the heel lift causes tendonitis. You know, one millimeter of internal rotation can cause dysfunction. So when I have that internal rotation, immediately when my femur is internally rotated, it causes me to pel tilt my pelvis, and that's where you know those impingement issues come into play because your body lays bone where there's dysfunction. So when you were squatting, you say you know 
if they have that, then you're jamming your, your uh, femur and your acetabulum in a non-functional way. So your body, its natural response to any dysfunction or any you know, increased load, um, it'll lay bone there. And that's called arthritis. Just puts calcium there to support the tissue. Same thing in your back, when your vertebra, when you're putting too much compression on that disc or intra-disc pressure, your body's natural response is to increase the surface area of the vertebra so it can support that more pressure from that, that, that the disc is giving. So it makes eventually the disc get smaller and you get arthritis in the spine. But same thing, you, you know, you get arthritis in your knee when you get osteoarthritis when you're early because your um, your body tries to lay more bone there to support it. it you know, also it's pulling it off the bone. Um, so you get that abulsion fracture and then your body lays more bone and you have those huge knee, uh, basically typical tuberosities that stick out real far. Um, but anyways, you have cam, you have pincer. Pincer is going to be when you have a, um, this is FAI, um, or for more acetabular impingement. Uh, pincer is when the bone is going to come off the pelvis because you have the acetabulum in the pelvis and then you have the femur that goes in there. So you can get an impingement from the bone sticking out of uh, the acetabulum or the pelvis and then you can get a cam that comes off the femur and basically grows into uh, the into the acetabulum. Both suck. Um, a lot of surgeries get down on them. But they can be prevented if you are moving correctly. So um, when I get people with that, I'll do, you know, uh, I do a lot of hip, hip distraction stuff where I'll, I'll, I'll do different bands where I'll put it around myself. It's, it's called in the PT world mulligan technique. Um, and and uh, I've, I've done versions of it. Um, and it's basically I put a band uh, on my back and, or on my butt and the patient is on their back on a, on a table and then I put my weight into that and then it distracts the femur out and then I'll, I'll do different ranges of motion and hip flexion and just to try to gain that range of motion back and get that hip where it's supposed to be right. um, until the point where you know it, it gets so bad that they need to get that kind of shit kicked off. Because they can tear your hip up. Hip, yeah, and that's one of the majority of hip flares I've ever seen. I've, they've gone and found either a cat or a, what's it called? Pincer. Cam or pincer. Cam or pincer, yeah. Lesion. Um, Just remember, pincer comes off the pelvis. Yeah. PP. PP. I'm going to call them PP lesions. PP lesions. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess so, if an athlete comes to you and just says, you know, my hips are tight. What what is your what is your I guess uh, system of figuring out? Okay, is his so as tight? Okay. Is it his iliacus? Is it his some form of a pelvic pelt dysfunction? Is it a femoral insertion dysfunction? Whatever it may be. So I'll do so on and so forth. a series of orthopedic tests. If Thomas tests, you have um, you know SI test for SI dysfunction as well. See if there's anything going on there. Um, and, and then you'll just do general hip range of motion, passive and active, because um, that really distinguishes whether it's more of a soft tissue or more of a bony block. Um, because if they have poor internal rotation, you know, passive um, and, and active, then it's gonna be more of that, you know, anatomical structure, it's gonna be a lot harder to fix. But if it's just one and not the other, then you can, you can really work soft tissue, um, motor pattern stuff, and, and then get that basically to where you want that to be. So basic inter internal and external rotation, I really like doing that in flexion. So you bring their hips into flexion, do internal and external rotation. What degree are you looking for of each? Oh man, you getting... Um, so I'll typically, um, I'll eyeball it to where, you know, I'll go ahead and lay your back here. Don't do Harris, he's got really bad hips. Come on over. Hand over, grandpa over here. All right, so I'll generally look to try to get this this heel to mid quad. Okay. So about forty five degrees there. I'm going to say probably thirty degrees. There's always you know their standard number for you know uh, age ranges, but I try to. This internal's not terrible. There we go. Bring the other one up. We'll check. 
left is your left side hurt worse, or is it just in the middle? The right side always hurts. Right side always just right on that S I joint or in the middle of the back? Yes, I S I right on that cross yeah. right there. So, you know, that could be if it's limited rotation on the hip, puts more pressure on that SF, SI joint because he's firing more off his side because that one's lacking, you know, a million different things. Um, so typically what I'll do is I'll try to get their, their hips to the range of motion that I see and think is necessary for that specific person. He's more of a power lifter, so he does not um, those really wide squats, so that's probably why he has this, the hip mobility that he has. So I, don't, I think that's kind of disguising his real injury because he has fake range of motion um, because of what you do. That's really just... So when Ali has limited internal core and external range of motion in the hip capsule, what are the cascade of events yeah. you see? So internal rotation, um, when they have that limited internal, uh, you know, I'm really going to look into the psoas, iliacus, you know, and, and see if, you'll know, see a lot of times, he doesn't have it, but when you do that internal rotation, you'll see their low back kind of arch yeah. because their their psoas is so short that it's causing them to get that hyperextension in their back. Um, you know, a little different with the external rotation; it's just really tight. Then that's going to mean that their external, the glute muscles, um, more intrinsic in like the gemellus muscles, um, and uh, maybe the piriformis. But you know, just palpation on those is a really good way to. Find what muscle specifically <laughs> is is the causation. Um, SI dysfunction is tough. <coughs> um, SI dysfunction. I will check extension of the hip. So flip on your stomach. There, right, heel to your butt. All right. So what I'll do is I'll check in this range of motion. See if there's limited extension there. I'll check his ability to get his foot there, and if any of these cause pain, it's a pretty good indication that there's, um, you know, SI dysfunction. And that SI dysfunction can be from hyperextension of the back, glutes not activating correctly, small foot not activating correctly, limited range of motion in the mid back. All of these things can cause that. So again, you know, I, I analyze all of the above to see, and then I usually fix all of the above because. 99% of the time, people limit their range of motion in the thoracic spine because of just our lifestyles now. We have terrible range of motion in the thoracic spine. Um, and then we gain all that range of motion in our back, getting that hyperlordotic curve. We don't use our butts ever. We, we have terrible glute activation. Um, that's across the board. So I'll, I very seldomly, and I guess that's probably not, the, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Um, I, I fix, even if it might not be causing the issue, I'll still stem up and below string to, you know, not just cover my bases and make sure that I'm fixing everything so that never comes back. Right. So. But you see, like, a few things um, we talked about last year is people mobilizing the low back when you want to stabilize it. So when someone has low back pain, you kind of have a different protocol. Yep. So, like, so, like, you talk about eagles, you know, the crossover stretch, like you don't yell like you go through that kind of stuff? Um, eagles, uh, yeah. These ones where you're cross body. Yeah, so I would avoid those as much as possible when you have low back pain. Um, I would do more thoracic spine mobilizations, like T-spine rotations, uh, the PVC one I've showed you guys before. Um, just simple things like this, just gaining range of motion, um, building mobility with the PVC, and then gaining stability with doing active uh, motor path and stuff, like the T-spine rotation. We're doing open books. Um, so when I do open book, I always have a foam roller here. And because my hip goes in flexion, when my hip goes into flexion, it prevents the lumbar spine from being recruited. So when I'm here, I'm gonna do the open books. I can go here, obviously. Once I start to bring my knee up, then I know that it's too far. So I'll just try to work that range of motion. Or I'll do the, this brings in scapular coordination with thoracic. Um, range of motion, so that's a, probably the next step. Um, obviously, scaps, and then I follow, watching, trying to keep that knee on the ground or on the PVC. And I follow it with my eyes, nice. bring it back, and then I will do uh, ten on each side, and then I will 
ingrain that pattern by sitting back on my heels into hip flexion, put my elbow in, and then work reps there to, to build that motor pattern to keep that range of motion. Say that again, why do, why do you sit back in hip flexion? Hip flexion limits my ability to um, gain range of motion from my lumbar spine. Perfect example is, I got this PVC. Okay, so when I try to get range of motion, uh, that's why golfers have such bad issues because they can get a lot of torque from their hips and their lumbar spine, Tiger Woods, for example. Um, but if I'm gaining too much range of motion from the lumbar spine and not enough from my thoracic, then I'm putting way too much rotation into that, which then causes the disc herniations and arthritis. So if I do this, this stretch right here, I do it up high, I feel a lot of tension in my low back and you see a lot of twisting in my low back, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? However, when I go into full hip flexion, get a good hinge, so I'm back into this position, I can put a glass of water there and not have that move. I have this here, I'm going to rotate, pulling myself into rotation, press away and look up to the ceiling and I can still keep that, you know, wow. front back over. So hip flexion limits range of motion in the, in the lumbar spine. So when, any, when doing any thoracic range of motion, always try to get into some sort of hip flexion. But yeah, so I, and again, I don't like doing those when, because then you're gonna get pops in the back. The only thing I like to do with acute low back pain, movement wise, um, is you know as some mobilizations, specific mobilizations that I do, and then distraction. Yeah. Um, especially if you have a disc herniation, if you have anything going down the legs, you want to limit it all ro ro uh, rotation. Because mechanism of injury for uh, disc herniations or disc falls or any annular issues, annular fibrotic issues in the disc is rotation. That's going to put a lot of pressure on that, not feel good, and not help the situation. Yeah, that's, I like that a lot. It's the, the hip flexion part. That's something I've always done it. It's one of those things that I didn't necessarily know why we did it. Mm -hmm. um, just following the people before us. So yeah. that's what allows you to not. Yep, so again, so if I'm here, if I don't have hip flexion, I get all the range of motion from my lumbar spine there. Yep. Not all, I get some from my thoracic spine. I'm getting a lot of tension right here in my low back. But if I'm here, hip flexion stabilizes low back. How about that? It's pretty good. I didn't know that. Locks it out. Where's the motion? Yeah, I wouldn't say it completely. And then you're still, you're showing the, the smashing of the low back. You're getting the yeah, so smashing. Um, so sorry, Dad. Yeah, so, I mean, what you, last time when you talked about low back, you were, you were talking, told me peanuts on the low back, yeah. just smashing, letting it sit on. Yeah, decompression. Actually, I got a yeah, good new one. You're probably going to love this. Um, so, have you guys seen those neck hammocks coming out? Yeah. It's like the same thing. You can do that with a band easily. Um, so, you want to spend the money? Uh, I'm on the line because. I know the people that, <laughs> that are making it. Online. So you can do that uh, with a band here, and then you can also do it for your lumbar spine. There's two ways to do it with your lumbar spine. Who wants to try this? Dude. <laughs> the, grab the, the bright green one there. All right, so first one, you're gonna just put this low here. And what I'm gonna do is you're gonna step into it. You put it about mid shin level. You're gonna put it right above your butt cheeks. So this is a good thing. Um, if the person has significant pain, I wouldn't have them do this for too long. Uh, but if you know if they've just been under a lot of you know tension throughout the week and doing a lot of volume, this is a great way for your athletes to just decompress that lower back. So this is way better than the peanut. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take you're gonna make sure it's flat on those PSIS, the PSIS on the sacrum. It's wrong. Straight up, right up above the SI joints, right on the dimples, okay? So what this is gonna do is gonna cause a decompression. You're gonna take two steps back, you're gonna sit to the ground, put this between your legs, just have it there, sit to the ground, keep your knee, the feet on the ground, and you're gonna melt all the way on your back. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Relax, Harris. So tense. And just, just move around. What do you feel, Harris, talk to me? Relief. Relief. <laughs> Yeah, daddy teams got you right. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that's right where I'm hurting too. Yeah. So it's gonna basically decompress that L5S1. Um, 
again, passively. The reverse hyper is really good to actively get blood flow there and build strength around that L5S1. This is a good way to just cut some, some distraction on that, that joint. Especially, I mean, all athletes have pain in this area just because everything we do. Um, we, I don't know if you've seen this before with the pitch arc. Pitch you the like, belt squat. Oh, yeah. We'll do, well, I mean, we'll do, and we got this from Louie, but so same thing, so we'll, we'll put it right on it. Send it down, and then we'll just we'll push them into extension. Depending on the injury, yeah. we'll, we'll push them into extension. Back, side, <coughs> side, the same thing when you're done with that. De decompression, you feel yeah. better, feel, but this is, this is freaking great. Yeah, you got this, Coach Owens? You got this on camera, right? We're still rolling? So this is a good one, and then this one's, uh, you know, another good variation. <coughs> so you're gonna come up out of that. Someone else push those. You can try both sides. You get both. Harris can take these. So you're gonna, now you're gonna keep it in that same spot. You're gonna be careful with your man stuff. You're gonna step over it. He doesn't have much force. So, so step forward, step forward, step forward. Pitch them together. Yeah. Step over it. Now <laughs> get, your, get your stuff four-handed. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to come straight out onto this thing. So you're gonna basically you want to put your hips off of this. So you're basically your pubic bone's gonna be there, and you're gonna grab this at the top. Oh, oh, <laughs> wow! What do this you feel, Josh? I just got two big pops. Two audibles? Yep. Uh, audibles. Audible, audible. <laughs> oh, big man, man, man up in here. So then you get left these legs, kind of. Coach, why don't you get the back side of this just so you can see how it's set up? Just let those legs hang. <laughs> this is some of my super sauce. This is really good. Um, how, so how much like two when minutes? You, when you see, you always two minutes for yeah. tissue stuff. Um, you, this is something you don't want to do for like ten minutes because you're gonna want to stay here for ten minutes. But just start slowly with this. Okay. So Why? Just because you can you can really relieve almost too much sometimes, and if they do yeah. have an actual issue, you know this can can not make it worse, but it can relax the muscles too much. You know, just like if if you have spasms there right. for a reason and you release them, it could it could make, make the rest of your day kind yeah. of tough. Yeah. Um, how much do you contribute, like teach spine immobility to low back pain? Um, how much when we talk about ascending, descending, or when you treat T spine, how much relief do you get in the low back with, with your with your patients? A lot. Yeah. Because again, you know, whether it's a desk jockey or an athlete, you know, and it's not only T it's the hips. So. I'll, I'll hit the hips, I'll hit the mid back, and I'll do a little distraction work, some soft tissue. So I'm treating the pain that's here, but I'm treating the problem, which is here right. and then here. Right. So if that's the problem, that's the causation. I guess this is good to go through. With T spine mobility, how much mobility are you looking for? <coughs> what, 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 if you're, if you're about an athlete, when you're like, okay, dude, that's not good, T spine mobility. Um, so you're gonna look and, and see, you know, the ability for an overhead squat, this is a quick assessment. You know, that also would be shorter stuff too, but uh, you know, range of motion and rotation. So the, t the exercise I just did, that's also a good test to see, you know, how far can they go. And you know, if, they're, if they're to the point where they're just looking to the wall, that's not good. You don't think, to yeah, I wouldn't be able to look at the ceiling. That's just a general rule of thumb there. Harris, you being all right over there? Come on up real good. Um, all right, well, I just want to try that. So this one's less uh, evasive. We, this, yeah, but this the bench <laughs> one, the bench one is fulcrum. Less, fulcrum is that the answer? The fulcrum is not there. Um, <laughs> harder for you to do in a group setting with your right. athletes. You can just put all these bands down. They can lay on the ground. That's the easier one. This one's which one? That one was more intense. Yeah. Um, but the other one was still really good. Both of them were good. That one I just felt. I mean, I got two big pops yeah. right where it hurts. Um. Other, do you have any, anything else for T-spine specifically? I mean, those are freaking nice. Um, extension and rotation, oh, with the foam roller. Um, okay, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, you're good. All right, Ex when we, when we're training extension, all right, um, this is something that, and this, I don't know if you, what your opinion is on this, but like, so, um, going into like hyperextension. Okay. Uh, okay. Like, there, there's, in the back and the low back, the okay. hyperextension yeah. low back. Um, like there's people that that will like Albert Meal, for example. He's a big name around. One of the oldest. He was with the Bulls and won all those championships. Michael Jordan. Um, 
like he'll talk about like you know people are like oh you got to stay in a neutral posture all the time and then he'll like kind of go off on his tangent about like well in the game of football you're going to get pushed into hypercenter sometimes yep. so if we've been in neutral posture this entire time then uh how are we going to respond to that in, on the playing field and then like so on the other end of the spectrum you have people like you know kelly Sturette who's like no matter what never going to ex- hyper extension yep. Um, so you know, like when you're training hyper hypers on the on the hyper extension yeah. machine, um, do you have a, a opinion on that based off? So training hyper extensions, um, I don't necessarily think that you need to go because that's actively using your muscles to bring you into extension. So that's not going to help your ability to take extension from uh, an anterior force. Right. So I'm building that anterior strength right. and and anti extension exercises like you know. Farmer carries, uh, overhead farm carries, um, dead bug stuff with band resistance, anti-extensive stuff. Um, so I kind of like both angles on that. I don't think you should be training in hyperextension, but um, you obviously are going to go into hyperextension when you compete sometimes. So in, in my opinion, I think training, and I said this a little bit ago, training in perfect form at all times or at least as much as you can at all times, it's going to make you more resilient to be able to go into that valve position to take that extension. Because I'm so strong in right. here, in anti-extension, and when I get hit, those muscles can take that and, no, and no, obviously no. not cause that big of an issue. As I said, I say that it's about, it's about the fact that we've trained you in this correct position so many times that yes, you're gonna get pushed out of it, but you're gonna know how to reset yes. And it's not going to be something that you think about. It's going to be something where we've created that motor pattern so many times yep. that when you do get forced into into hyperextension or flexion or whatever it may be, you're going to know how to correct that because yep. we've, we've created it. It's going to be, it's not even going to be your mind. It's going to be a subconscious uh, thing that happens as a, a reflex. Um, you know, and that's, you know, spine specific, you know, um, you are, you're, you're going to get, you know, hit if, if you're training, and you know, why, why would I train in, in valgus positions to, you know, that's not going to make me stronger to get hit in the knee and, and take a valgus stress, yeah. you know, uh, and, and, you know, every body part's different, but, you know, I would strength and try to get, and get as much strength out of perfect form, and I always go back to the knee because it's easiest, but, you know, then when I do get hit in the knee, my, my knee is so strong in perfect position, then I can take that that whip and not you know fly farther and, and end up you know causing structural damage. 